Welcome to the Director's Cut with East Lansing Public Library's Director, Kristen Shelley. Hello and welcome to a special episode of the Director's Cut. My name is Beth Scanlon, Teen Services Specialist at the East Lansing Public Library and guest host. In this special episode, we will visit with a first-time author who writes an inspiring coming-of-age novel about living through a tremendous loss and the wonder of finding oneself. My guest today is Sarah Bauman a native of East Lansing, and the author of The Light in the Lake. Sarah's debut novel is a moving page-turner about grief, family, the possibility of magic, and the beauty of science. While in East Lansing, she was a middle and high school English teacher and now works as an educational consultant and author. She graduated from Grinnell College and the University of Michigan, then went on to teach English overseas in three different countries, China, Bolivia, and Germany. So, Sarah, welcome to the Director's Cut. You grew up in East Lansing. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. (laughs) We're excited that you're with us today. Uh, You grew up in East Lansing. Welcome home. Uh, Tell us a little bit about what the town was like back then. Do you have a favorite memory of being in the library as a child? Oh, thanks so much for that good question. I have great memories of the library But some of my favorites are from working there as a teenager. I was a page, and I loved being surrounded by books. So being able to spend hours shelving them and looking at titles was really perfect for me. That's incredible. It's really neat that you're coming back to the library that you were working in as a teenager. Um, What a special experience for all of us. Um, Did you always dream of becoming an author? I'd love to. So I've always loved to write in addition to read. I think my love of writing began with reading. My parents were avid readers and read to me every evening when I was growing up. And I think that really fostered a love of stories. And I began writing at a really early age. I remember entering the Sarah Tarkoff writing contest every year, which is an East Lansing staple. And although I always wrote stories, I'm not sure I really thought of being an author as something that I would be able to do. I'm not really sure I even thought of it as an actual job. It was more just this mythical thing that people somehow managed. Um, (laughs) But as I got older, I definitely honed in a little bit on wanting to find a way to keep writing and It wasn't until fairly recently that I decided to start writing for middle grade readers. That was always my favorite genre of book, still is, even as an adult. And the story ideas started coming, and I was really excited to start writing for that group. That's incredible. That's how I got here. Yeah, so many people have... um such a hard time connecting with that middle school age group, you know, like the kiddos who are Mm -hmm. leaving elementary school, entering middle school. Um, It can be a kind of tough age of transition for some kids. Um, And I think it can be. Yeah, you do a masterful job of portraying that in the light in the lake. Um, I'm wondering. Thank you. Yeah. If you could tell us a little bit about what the process of writing a book was like for you, um, how long did it take you from the time you had this idea um, for a story to when it was uh, fully published? That's a great question. A lot of people are surprised, I think, by how long it can take from the time the idea happens to the time of publication or even from the time the book sells. I also want to note that I wrote a book before The Light in the Lake that will probably never be published, although I'm using some ideas from it for (laughs) another book. But I mention that because writing a book that's not published is, I think, a really important part of the process Mm. because I had to write that book in order to figure out how to write a book. And even though every book is different and I don't feel like I'm an expert now at all, just because I've written, you know, one that was published, um, I still think that it's a really important part of the learning process to go through the writing and editing and learn how all of that works and then keep persisting even though the book doesn't end up being published. I think that that's that was an important stage for me. Um, yeah, and I think I that's... Did sorry, I was just going to say... the idea for The Light in the Lake 
almost immediately after I kind of decided to shelve the book that I had been trying to get published. So from that point, from the point of the idea to the point that the book finished and kind of ready to start sending to literary agents was probably about a year. And then it took another six to eight months probably before it sold. So my agent and I were working on further editing and revision to kind of prepare it for submission. Well, it's so interesting that you spoke about that, um, writing that first book and having to go through the process of, you know, constructing a story and, you know, fleshing out characters. Um, I think Mm -hmm. that many people who dream of writing aren't aware of um, how many uh, times you may have to try before it kind of sticks. A second time doesn't even sound that that bad. (laughs) Right, right. I mean, I feel fortunate that my second book ended up being published, but it would have been completely normal for me to write several more books before I landed on the one that, that ended up going with a publisher. So one thing that I mention to students when I go into schools is I say, you know, it would have been very, very easy for me to give up after that first book didn't go anywhere. Mm. Like, wouldn't that have been, it would have made sense in some way. I could have said, well, I tried, but it didn't work. But it's so important to just keep pushing past that feeling because it can work and it just takes time. That's such a great message for writers of all ages. (laughs) Um, (laughs) What inspired this particular story? I'm I'm specifically very interested in um, why you chose to tackle the topic of grief and loss at such a tender age. It's a really good question. I was inspired to write this story, I think, by a few primary factors. First of all, I was living in northern Vermont at the time. I lived there for six years, and I was really inspired by the surroundings, by my environment. Um, The setting of The Light in the Lake is strongly based on that, and I really think that I would not have written that particular story if I hadn't been in that place. It's a story that's very much fueled. The concept of grief I don't think I have as good an answer for this as people deserve because the idea of the story came to me with that piece in it. And I think, you know, I've been interested in the idea of grief and how people deal with grief, especially at younger ages. I know that kids are dealing with really difficult things in their lives, and I think that It can be helpful for books to grapple with some of those topics because there are kids who are grappling with those topics. But I don't know that I have a logical reason beyond that why the idea presented itself, but it did and I went with it. So some of the other elements like the environmental issues were also inspired by some things that were happening in Vermont at the time when I was drafting the book, um, some issues with water quality and new regulations for small farmers. And I was really interested in that because my grandparents were dairy farmers and I spent many, many um, very happy times there as a child and it was really formative in my growing up. So I think that that really played into the story as well. Wonderful. Um, there's something about a young person who passes away having never lost the innocence of wonder and the belief in magic. Uh Um, Addie is such an analytical thinker that it seems like it's only through that loss that she's able to embrace her own Uh sense of wonder and mystery. Why do you think that's so? And why is the balance of magic and science important to you? I love that you put it that way, that it's almost it's the loss of, of Amos that awakens this potential in Addie for looking at the world in a magical way as well. To be honest, I think that I've never lost this to some degree. I'm the kind of person who, if I'm out in the woods or 
um, out on the water, I'm looking at the way light reflects and I'm thinking, what else could be underneath, even though technically I know it's sunlight or (laughs) that really does look like a fairy house. You know, I just look at the world in that way. I'm extremely committed to science and the importance of scientific understanding. I just like to explore that tension because I think I feel it, especially when I'm outdoors. I think that nature invokes this sense of magic and wonder in us. And so meshing that with what we know about the world, what we can empirically know is, is an interesting point of tension that I like to explore. Yeah, I I relate to that. I do think there's still wonder and magic in out in our natural world and we're all kind of suffering this loss of our natural world through pollution and climate yeah. change. So I think that parallel yeah. in the story of the very real loss of um a sibling or a child depending on whose right. point of view we're looking at um and the loss of or the potential loss of our natural world um that's a really beautiful parallel that runs through the story. I I think it's wonderful that yeah. um you know Greta Thunberg was just named Times Person of the Year. She's a young person who is out there um, very vocally advocating for um, saving our planet. And um, yeah. here you have a young person. Amazing. Yeah. And you have this young person, this young protagonist, Addie, in your story, who's kind of doing that same thing. So I think it's a really uh-huh. g- great time, a moment in time to be um, featuring a character like that. That is such a great point. Thank you. (laughs) Um, It's a really pivotal time, I think, for our natural world and people disconnected from it can be a danger, you know, as we face the challenges that we're looking at. So, yeah, I really agree. Well, a couple of times in the story, the locals are skeptical or outright reject knowledge that comes from, quote unquote, outsiders, even if they are Uh experts in the field. Um, Could you talk a little bit about that dynamic? Have you seen that play out in real life? And why was it an important aspect of the way this story was told? I think that 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 is a really good question. I think it's an important Another point of tension, I think, to explore. Um, I think, you know, for for Addie, one of the, and her family, one of the difficulties is that the issues with Maple Lake, part of their source is fairly close to home. And I think, you know, her aunt and uncle live very close to the land and are committed to their animals and to, and to their property and to being stewards of that. And so I think it's not just as black and white an issue as we sometimes want to make it. And I remember um, after college, I was interning at a prairie preserve that was owned by a college. This was in Iowa. And I learned a lot about environmental stewardship and conservation. But a really interesting moment for me was when I learned that over 90% of Iowa's native prairie wasn't there anymore. And Iowa is a really agricultural state. And I was sort of grappling with this knowledge that farms, which I loved, which are very important for human survival and, and which I, you know, deeply cared about on a very personal and visceral level, were in part responsible for the lack of this native ecosystem that I was trying to preserve. So I think I am always interested in that tension of how, you know, humans coexist with their environment in ways that are advantageous for both. And that's kind of a long way of saying that I think it's natural for people to be skeptical about some of the issues because they can poke at our own survival in a way. And it's easy to feel particularly, I think, in a smaller, more rural area very protective of our own knowledge of the landscape because um, 
it's not something that everybody might know on as intimate a level. So I really tried to portray kind of the understandable and gray nature of these kinds of conflicts because they're just very real. I think, you know, as humans, these are things that we have to struggle with. And so I wanted to show that happening in a sympathetic way and also show that that balance is possible in the form of Addie's response, which I thought was a brave choice on her part. Very brave. (laughs) Um, I guess my final question is kind of um, about what advice you would give to young writers or young climate change activists, young people who are looking to do the kind of work um, that you're doing, whether it's sending this message out through a book or being out there um, actively researching, you know, pollution. Um, what is it you would say to them uh, now when they're still young and they're right in the heart of kind of those addy years of, of uh, mm-hmm. middle school and all the things that are going on with family and, and social life, etc.? That's a great question. I think, first of all, I would tell them that we need their voices, even if they're sometimes not sent that message. The truth is that we do need their voices. Um, Secondly, I think Greta is a great example of how small, big change can begin. It can be so tiny at first and then it can grow. So just because a step seems like a small one doesn't mean that it can't lead somewhere very um, influential. And then also I would encourage young people to find the way to make a difference that feels right to them. They might be the kind who loves to campaign and knock on doors, but if they're not, there are other ways to express their support and, and to get out there. And if writing, for example, is a way that they can do that, then they should put their heart into that and feel good knowing that they're making the change that they can. Wonderful. Wonderful advice for our young people of East Lansing who um, are growing up in the same place where you grew up. Absolutely. Yeah. Sarah Bauman will be at the East Lansing Public Library for an author reading and book signing on Tuesday, December 17th at 7 p.m. Book sales are courtesy of Schuler's Books. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you. I really appreciate your time and your terrific questions. Well, we look forward to seeing you in person next week. Sounds wonderful. You have been listening to The Director's Cut, an East Lansing Public Library podcast. 